from uh, about 15 years on up, uh, a great deal of my thoughts were uh, basically unshareable. We are all evil in some form or another. Yes, I am evil. Not 100%, but I am evil. My mother was a, a sick, angry, hungry, and very sad woman. I hated her, but I wanted to love my mother. This is Serial Killing, a podcast. Hello, my name is Alyssa Carroll, and welcome to Serial Killing, a podcast, where we go through the life stories of serial killers to see if we might catch a glimpse of why they displayed their famous, vile, and disturbing behaviors. Special thanks to some of my patrons as always. Rachel, Whitney, Pixie, Maya, Alethea, Elena, Aaron, Katoras, Catherine, Sam, Linda, Janice, Katerina, Teresa, Sarah, Sophie, Nanette, my dear two Emmas, Emily, Gabrielle, Galen, Cassandra, Bree, David, John, and my spicy girl, Judy. Thank you so much. You are truly appreciated. And for everyone else, please feel free to join my Patreon so that I can create more of what you crave. This podcast is a continuation on the whole vampire theme. This one will be on the vampire of Dusseldorf. So he was born in a suburb of Cologne, Germany in May 26th, 1883. And as we always do, to get some context as to the world that he was born into, let's get into some history for that time. 1883 was the year Karl Marx died. Karl Marx was a German man of many studies, which included philosophy, economy, history, sociology, political theory, journalism, and he was a socialist revolutionary. And while he was born in Germany, due to his political ideas, he was forced to live in exile in London for decades. While in London, he continued to ponder and write about his ideas, which later developed into his pamphlet, quote, The Communist Manifesto, as well as three volumes of, quote, Das Kapital, and Just let me say it now that I'm sure I'm going to butcher some of these words. I apologize. Mostly Karl Marx's ideas and theories developed into what we all know as the political ideology called Marxism. Now, on the other end of that political debate, Bismarck, who was the German chancellor during the late 1800s, campaigned against socialism, even though it was a growing force in Germany at the time. Bismarck attempted to stop it by introducing welfare measures, including health insurance. The next year, he then introduced accident insurance, followed by old age pensions, like the U.S.'s Social Security benefits in 1889. But as hard as he tried, socialism continued to gain strength in Germany, and by 1914, the Social Democratic Party was the largest party. With the Social Democratic Party growing popular, along with increased military action, the world was headed toward World War I. Due to this social unrest, as well as severe unemployment and incredible hardships in Germany, many, many German people began to emigrate to the United States. In fact, from 1820 to 1870, over 7.5 million immigrants from Northern and Western Europe came to the U.S., which was more than the total population of the U.S. at that time. Roughly one-third of that was from Germany. The largest settlements of Germans were in New York City, Baltimore, Cincinnati, St. Louis, and Milwaukee. For the rest of the world, in 1883, on a small island in southwest Indonesia, the volcano Krakatoa erupted and became the greatest natural disaster in the 19th century. 
The fallout was felt around the globe. The force of the eruption alone was the loudest sound ever recorded. The shockwaves traveled around the earth a mind-blowing seven times. The blast was 10,000 times greater than that of the bomb dropped on Hiroshima. It killed over 36,000 people and the survivors anywhere near the area had to then deal with the tsunamis, more eruptions and unbelievably hot ash clouds. It made the sky appear to be blood red. In Mexico, astronomer Jose Bonilla gave a statement about seeing more than 300 dark, unidentified objects crossing in front of the sun while watching sunspot activity at an observatory. There are photographs that exist, but they were taken with these very big photographic plates that were awkward to set up and manipulate, so the photos are fuzzy. Ultimately, it turned out to just be very high-flying geese, but this became the first instance where a photograph was taken and objects in the picture were stated to be unidentified objects. The next and last bit of history is pretty huge. Alexander Graham Bell, the inventor of the telephone, was somewhat of an advocate for eugenics. He started off studying selective breeding in animals, but moved on to be a supporter of eugenics with regards to human breeding. He didn't get so into it that he advocated the actual control of societal reproduction, but did say there should be legislation to prevent what he called undesirable ethnic elements immigrating to the U.S. and encouraging the, quote, evolution of a higher and nobler type of man in America, end quote. In 1883, Alexander gave a eugenics lecture at the National Academy of Science about a, quote, defective variety of the human race, end quote. And in 1884, he published a paper titled, quote, Upon the Formation of a Deaf Variety of the Human Race, end quote where he warned that deaf people were coming together and forming clubs, getting married and having babies, and the eventual end was that they would use their special language to create a deaf race. He wasn't necessarily against deaf people being married so much as he thought the teaching of sign language or building special schools should stop. So you see, Murder Fam, this was the atmosphere that Peter was born into. So to jump right in, there was a long history of alcoholism and mental trouble on the paternal side of his family, though I dug and dug to try to find past family lineage, but it was most difficult to find anything. On Peter's maternal side, they seem to have originated from a fairly respectable stock. His mother had been the daughter of an affluent proprietor owning some type of business, and she had five brothers and sisters, all of whom lived to a ripe age, sources say. Now, how they met, I also couldn't find. What I was able to find was that his father worked as a molder for molding metal. Peter Curtin was the firstborn and eldest out of 13 children in his family, born into extreme poverty and deprivation. It was stated that the large family was forced to live in a one-bedroom apartment because even though his father made a meager wage, which was still at least somewhat adequate enough to house and feed his family, well, nearly all of it was spent on alcohol due to his severe alcoholism. His father was also extremely physically abusive toward his wife, and he did not spare his children either. Being a sexual sadist, he would even line his children up, then rape his wife and make his children watch. Being that Peter was the oldest child, he did his best to absorb as much of the violence as he could on behalf of his younger siblings and... Well, at least sometimes he was successful. 
So during that time in Germany, there was no real place for a mother to take her children and seek shelter. And really, the expectation was for the wife to just deal with it and suffer in silence. Peter later stated that had his father not gotten married and had that, you know, sort of predictable body available, he would have been a serial rapist. Peter was quoted as saying, quote, the whole family suffered through his drinking, for when he was in drink, my father was terrible. I, being the eldest, had to suffer most. As you may well imagine, we suffered terrible poverty, all because the wages went on drink. We all lived in one room, and you will appreciate what effect that had on me sexually." End quote. So at the very tender age of five years old, it was discovered that Peter had tortured and drowned two puppies in a nearby creek. Sources stated that at the age of nine, he befriended a dog catcher who lived closely in his neighborhood. The man was a degenerate who showed him how to masturbate. He also tortured dogs and had Peter do the same. And the boy welcomed this unfortunate friendship and a significant bond developed between the two. Not long after this, Peter reportedly drowned a classmate while playing on a raft in the Rhine. When the boy's horrified friend dived in to rescue him, Peter pushed the boy under the raft and held him down until he suffocated. At the age of 13, he began a relationship with a girl who, he later stated, allowed him to undress her and do all manner of things to her, but did not allow him to have intercourse with her. Due to this frustration, his sexual deviance progressed. And during all of this, his sexual urges were developing rapidly, and he was soon committing bestiality on sheep and goats in the nearby stables. And during one of these assaults on one of the animals, he acted on his urge to stab the sheep while still joined, which created a, quote, most powerful sensation, end quote. So he began doing this with some regularity. In 1889, when Peter was 16 years old, his father forced him to start apprenticing with a molder, which he detested. Needless to say, that didn't last long. But he stole every bit of money from this employer, went home, stole all of the money from his parents, and ran away from home. He was soon to receive the first of a total of 27 prison sentences that would occupy 24 years of his life. The crimes were at first not particularly horrible, mostly thieving for food and clothing and often gaining short sentences in Dusseldorf's prisons. Around this same time, his father was jailed for 13 years for raping Peter's 13-year-old sister. But upon Peter's release from detention in 1889, 17-year-old Peter now began living with a mentally ill, masochistic sex worker twice his age. He also held a lot of animosity toward the authorities in his detention center, wanting revenge for how he had been treated. So, at this point, his education, if you will, was now complete, and the inherent sadistic impulses were transferred from animals to human beings. And that was his childhood. I really think it speaks rather vividly for itself, but let's take a look. So, we have talked at length about certain traits that can be inherited from generation to generation. And side note, there's also the issue with the inherited generational trauma, but that's for another podcast. So, if someone in a family has a mental illness, personality disorder, what have you, then statistically, this increases the likelihood that the next generation could inherit the same or similar situations, if you will. So, 
looking at Peter's father, we see some very serious issues. Looking at an article titled, quote, Familial Paraphilia, a pilot study with the construction of genograms, end quote. Biological factors are likely predisposing and modulating elements in sexually deviant behavior. Paraphilia more closely aligns with antisocial behaviors than, say, schizophrenia. Paraphilic behaviors also tend to cluster in some families. The article stated that most aspects of human sexual behavior, including deviant sexual behavior, are primarily emulated by learning and modeling processes resulting from social and familial influences. Okay, but ultimately, as with most things in this territory and the genetic connection, you know, the old saying, more research is needed. However, it cannot be understated that Peter grew up not only enduring severe abuse from his father, but also was forced to witness his own mother being raped repeatedly. Any type of abuse that children endure, be it physical, emotional, or psychological, sexual, whatever, can cause long-term difficulties with regards to behavior and mental health development, as we all know very well. It also plays a huge role in future disordered mental development and causes serious behavioral issues. The abused children often display disturbed forms of attachment and abnormal emotional responses for the rest of their lives. Attachment disorders look like this. They generally have an underdeveloped conscience. They might just not feel guilt, regret, or remorse after bad behavior. Certainly, aggression becomes an issue, and they also have a much harder time showing genuine care and affection. They do not like to be touched and are often very uncomfortable with physical affection, such as hugs. And then we know that Peter did at least try to shield his younger siblings from the abuse. Okay, so let's throw in some serious sexual abuse. According to the U.S. National Library of Medicine, National Institutes of Health, children who are victims of sexual abuse usually suffer from PTSD or post-traumatic stress disorder, early sexual initiation with behavioral and internalizing issues, attachment insecurity, and other psychiatric disorders. Major depressive disorder, attention deficit hyperactivity disorder, Oppositional Defiance Disorder, Separation Anxiety Disorder, Specific and Social Phobias, and or Generalized Anxiety Disorder. Some grow up to be sexual predators themselves. And finally, with the bestiality, this one doesn't have a lot of literature, but some limited data has found that zoophilia, zoophilic disorders among people who were sexually abused or are violent or sex offenders. I mean, it would take hours to go through all of this detrimental stuff that kids experience when they are physically and sexually abused and what those same kids look like 20 years later and on. But you get the idea. Peter was doomed from day one. So let's get back to the story. As we know, Peter ran away from home several times to try and escape the abuses he endured at home. And while gone, he would hang out with the local petty thieves who taught him very well. He did the best he could to fend for himself, often stealing food and clothes. Peter fled to Koblenz about an hour southeast of Cologne. As we talked about before, he began a relationship with a sex worker who he said would allow him to do all kinds of sadistic sexual things to her, but he never actually loved her. He was never able to feel any kind of real love for anyone in his whole life due to the abuse of his childhood. But Peter was described as quite charming and handsome, and when he had money, he was dressed nicely, 
cleanly shaven. He had a good complexion, as they said, and he had no issues getting noticed by girls. So not long after he fled to Koblenz, he was arrested for breaking and entering along with theft, but was only sentenced to one month in prison. He was soon released and went right back to committing petty crimes and sexual deviancy without skipping a beat. It goes without saying that he was arrested off and on many times in his young adult years. His sentences were carried out in a jail in Dusseldorf, a short distance north of Cologne. He hated the confinement of prison and began to feel true rage against society as a whole. But he also discovered a new level of depravity while incarcerated. You see, he would act up in prison on purpose just to be thrown into solitary confinement. He would then commit brutal sexual acts on himself while in solitary, which fed his ever-growing fantasies. So he would then do things to try to remain in solitary confinement, but eventually he would be released back out into the world. In 1904, when Peter Curtin was 21 years old, he was drafted into the German army. He nearly immediately fled. During this time, he began setting barns and haylofts on fire. He would then sit quietly from a distance and watch emergency services try to put out the fires, deriving great pleasure from the light of the flames and the people yelling, or screaming. But his desertion of the army did not go unnoticed, and he was eventually convicted of desertion, arson, and robbery, and was sentenced to prison for eight years. During that time, he later confessed, his fantasies became increasingly violent, and he would sexually satisfy himself while thinking about killing large numbers of society. In May 1913, Peter was free again. He later stated he was walking the streets looking for a place to rob. He decided to break into a pub whose owners lived in an apartment above the bar. He went upstairs, opened doors to see if there was anything of value, and behind one door was a sleeping 10-year-old little girl. He grabbed her and began strangling her. Once she was unconscious, he molested her. Peter stated, quote, I had a small but sharp pocket knife with me, and I held the child's head and cut her throat. I heard the blood spurt and drip on the mat beside the bed. It spurted in an arch right over my hand. The whole thing lasted about three minutes. Then I went, locked the door again, and went back home to Dusseldorf." End quote. Unfortunately, when the girl was found, her father immediately suspected his own brother. They had gotten into a violent argument the day before, and there didn't seem to be any other motive. The brother was arrested, but there wasn't enough proof, and he was freed. Peter, on the other hand, had returned to the town the next day and went to a cafe across the street to hear the gossip about what had happened to the little girl. He drank a beer and heard someone talking about how someone else had already been pointed out as the perpetrator and he knew he had gotten away with it. For weeks, he visited the girl's grave, moving the soil in his hand and climaxing. And now his sadistic, bloodthirsty appetite was further awakened. Two months later, he murdered a 17-year-old girl by strangling her and then pleasured himself at the sight of the blood coming from her mouth. Thankfully, not long after, Peter was arrested for burglary and arson and was put in prison. In April of 1921, the now 38-year-old Peter was released and promptly moved in with his sister in Altenburg, which would be nearly a five-hour drive east from Cologne, Germany. He met his sister's friend, August Scharf. 
August owned a candy shop, but had been a sex worker in her prior life and also served time for shooting and killing her former fiancé. Two years later, they were married. Peter later said that while they did have sex regularly, he could only achieve an orgasm by fantasizing about violence and murder. But he did get a steady job and life stayed relatively level for him. He had no close friends other than his wife, whom he actually adored. So in 1925, Peter and his wife moved to Dusseldorf, where he began to assault women and burglarize again. He had somehow been able to keep himself from killing anyone for four years. The arson and petty crimes seemed to be enough to keep him satisfied. He later stated he would look up at the evening sunset in Dusseldorf and say to himself, quote, the sunset was blood red on my return, end quote, seeing it as an omen that his destiny was to be in Dusseldorf. But then in 1929, Peter could no longer restrain himself. In February, he followed an elderly woman, grabbed her and dragged her to a bushy area where he then stabbed her 24 times with scissors. Some penetrated down to her bones and yet somehow she survived. Then just five days later, he attacked a nine-year-old little girl, strangled her, then stabbed her in the stomach, the torso, the face and in her groin area with scissors. He then molested her body. Peter dragged her body and stuffed it under some hedges where he attempted to set it on fire, then climaxed at the site of his work. She was found the next day. Just a few days after that, he murdered a middle-aged mechanic. Peter stabbed this man 20 times in the back, head, and even his eyes. He returned to the scene the next day to find the police investigating the area. When he saw the police notice him, well, he just walked right up to the officers and told them that he had heard about the murder and that's why he was there. And if you've learned anything about serial killers, they have a tendency to return to the scene and the authorities make a note of the people at crime scenes. So investigators decided all three of the recent attacks had been done by the same perpetrator. On and on he murdered, strangling, stabbing, raping. One victim he buried in a shallow grave in a cornfield. He returned to the body a few weeks later with the idea that he would nail her corpse to a tree into a sort of morbid crucifix statue but found that he couldn't hold the weight of the body up and nail her extremities at the same time. So he laid down, put the body over his own and lovingly stroked and caressed the corpse. He later said this filled him with satisfaction. He then attacked a five-year-old girl, leaving a fairground, strangling and stabbing her. But this time he gave in to a temptation that he had had. He drank the blood from her wounds. The very next day, Peter approached a housemaid and demanded she have sex with him. She, of course, refused. He yelled, quote, well, die then, and stabbed her repeatedly, though thankfully she survived the attack. In the hospital, she was unfortunately unable to give a very accurate description of the man that attacked her other than he was middle-aged. At this point, the media had dubbed the maniac the, quote, vampire of Dusseldorf. At first, they thought there was no way these vicious and brutal murders were being performed by just one person. And then during the summer of 1929, the police were receiving tens of thousands of letters, mostly demanding justice, but some offered a few leads, which the police did their best to follow up on. They interviewed over 9,000 people, but they were no closer to finding the murderer. 
At some point during this year of savage and brutal slayings, Peter changed his weapon of choice from scissors to a hammer. He ultimately wanted to throw off the police. As 1929 went on, he attacked a woman and bludgeoned her in the head repeatedly, both before he raped her and then continued after. He did this to woman after woman. Finally, after his last murder, he sent a letter, and he had sent a few already, to a local newspaper detailing his sickening crimes and threatened to continue his reign of terror. A handwriting expert was brought in to examine the letters received, and they concluded that they had been written by the same man, and therefore there was only one murderer. Then on May 14, 1930, Peter Curtin saw a young lady standing at the train station. He approached her and started a conversation by which he learned that she had just recently moved there and was looking for housing as well as a job. Peter invited her to his apartment for food and drinks. Now, she was a smart girl and realized quickly that what he was actually offering her was a sexual encounter, and she politely declined. He then offered to escort her to a hotel, and she did follow out of social grace, only he took her through a secluded area of some woods, where he grabbed her by the throat and tried to choke her while he raped her. She was somehow able to scream, and he released her. But the young woman did not report the incident to the police. She didn't want the shame and label of being a rape victim. She instead wrote to a friend of hers and told her what had happened. However, she had put the wrong address on the letter, and the post office worker opened the letter to try to get it to the correct person. But after reading it, the panicked postal worker took the letter to the police. So at first, the police didn't think the attack was related to the vampire of Dusseldorf, but after interviewing the victim, she agreed to take the police to the address that Peter had given her. Peter, of course, wasn't there, but the landlady positively identified his description and gave them his name. So Peter was casually returning home when he saw the officer and the woman there, and he fled waiting for them to leave. Once gone, he went home and confessed everything to his wife. He told her that he was, in fact, the vampire of Dusseldorf. He told her to turn him in so that she would get the rather substantial reward for his capture. He wanted to make sure she was taken care of. She then contacted the police. Peter was arrested, and once in custody, he freely and happily confessed to all of his crimes, 10 murders and 31 attempted murders, along with arson and theft. His excuse was, as he described, the abuse he endured at the hands of his father, that the raping of his mother in front of him as a young boy fostered the sadomasochistic tendencies he had, He told the experts that the sight of fresh blood coming from a wound would make him have an orgasm. He confessed that he drank so much blood from one of his victims that it had actually made him quite ill and he had thrown it up. Peter's trial was on April 13th, 1931 charged with nine counts of murder and seven counts of attempted murder. Peter pleaded not guilty by reason of insanity. The doctor who had interviewed him to try to see whether or not he was fit to stand trial testified that Peter was sane. During the trial, Peter changed his plea to guilty. He said, quote, I have no remorse as to whether recollection of my deeds makes me feel ashamed, I will tell you that thinking back to all the details is not at all unpleasant. I rather enjoy it." 
the judge asked him if he even had a conscience, to which Peter replied, quote, I have none. Never have I felt any misgiving in my soul. Never did I think to myself that what I did was bad, even though human society condemns it. My blood and the blood of my victims must be on the heads of my torturers. The punishments I have suffered have destroyed all my feelings as a human being. That was why I had no pity for my victims. End quote. His trial lasted 10 days, and the jury took only two hours to find him guilty and sentence him to death. His death penalty was to be beheaded by guillotine. Peter remained completely calm during the sentencing. His last meal was Wiener schnitzel, fried potatoes, and a bottle of white wine. And then just before his sentence was to be carried out, he asked someone, quote, Tell me, after my head is chopped off, will I still be able to hear, at least for a moment, the sound of my own blood gushing from the stump of my neck? That would be the pleasure to end all pleasures. End quote. He was beheaded on July 2nd, 1931. His head was then dissected to see if there were any malformation of the brain to which none were noted, and then it was mummified. Peter Curtin's mummified head is actually on display at the Ripley's Believe It or Not Museum in the Wisconsin Dells in Wisconsin. So, Peter was a sexual sadist and all of his murders were sexually motivated. Once the act was over, he was satiated. He falls under the hedonist type serial killer category, meaning lust, thrill, gain. He made the connection in his mind between personal violence and sexual satisfaction. He felt great pleasure from killing and he eroticized the experience. He was never officially diagnosed with a specific mental disorder, but considering he felt no love or bond with any other person other than his wife, who really only served a specific purpose and he only described himself as being fond of, it is reasonable to assume he was essentially a pathologically oversexed psychopath and individual so self-centered that in his eyes, no other human being mattered. It is important to note, though, that Peter thought a lot about himself and reached a fair degree of self-recognition. He was aware of his fatal sadistic propensity, but always explained this due to heredity and his upbringing. There were a number of occasions, however, when Curtin seems to have recognized his evil nature and made it clear to a victim in doing so almost apologizing for his unnecessary actions. This is highly unusual for lust killers of Peter's type who are normally entirely convinced by their motives for atonement. So in my most humble opinion, Peter Curtin could have inherited some genetic propensity toward paraphilia and violence. It was stated that his family on his father's side suffered with mental illness as well as addiction. There aren't any noted issues on his mother's side, though, but he was also conditioned from a young age to combine the pleasures of sex with extreme violence, which would take a toll on any child. So was he born to kill or was he conditioned to kill? Tell me guys, what do you think? You can leave me a comment below if you're watching. All of my contact information is in the notes. And again, considering become a patron if you'd like. And as always, thank you so, so much for listening because I know you could be listening to anyone else, but you chose me and I really appreciate that. Thank you so much, Murder Fam. Have a great day.